a CBC color presentation. That vicious dragon dead at my feet. Say 
that you don't know where you were born or who your parents were? No idea. I only know that not very far from here is my straw hut which protects me from the cold and rain. But how do you live? Eating and drinking just as everyone else does. How do you get it? I exchange, of course. I catch all kinds of birds for the star flaming queen and her lady. In return, I receive food and drink every day for them. Star flaming queen? Tell me, good friend, were you ever fortunate enough to see this goddess of the night? See her? See the star flaming queen? Well, you can boast of ever having seen her. The way he stares at me, pretty soon I shall begin to be afraid of him. Why do you stare at me so suspiciously? Well, I, uh, I was wondering whether you are a human being or not. What was that? Considering those feathers covering you, you look rather like... Not like a bird by any chance. Stay away from me, I tell you, and don't you trust me because I have the strength of a giant. Oh, if he doesn't begin to be afraid of me soon, I shall have to make a run for it. <laughs> then perhaps it was you who saved me and fought this poisonous monster? Ah! Is it dead? I hope. But tell me, friend, how in the world did you ever fight this dragon? You have no weapons. Weapons? Who wants weapons? A good squeeze of my hand. <laughs> That's all I need. So then you choked it? I choked it. Never in my life was I as strong as I am today. Oh, that's for me. Who are these ladies? Well, who they actually are, I don't know myself. I only know that each day they take in my birds and bring me wine, sugar bread, and nice juicy apples in return. I suppose they are very beautiful. Oh, I don't think so. For if they were, they wouldn't have to cover up their faces. Oh, you ask me whether these ladies are beautiful, and I can only say that never in my life did I see three more charms. That ought to do it. What can I have done today to make them so angry? Here, lovely lady, I've brought you my bird. This time in return, the queen sends you instead of wine, pure, clear water. And she ordered me instead of sugar bread to give you this stone. What? I have to eat stones? And instead of juicy apples, I have the honor of locking up your mouth with this padlock. <laughs> I imagine you would like to know why the Queen punishes you in such a strange way. Mm -hmm. So that you will never again tell lies to strangers. And you shall never boast of heroic deeds achieved by others. Tell us, did you kill this dragon? Mm -hmm. Who did then? Mm -hmm. Prince, it was we who saved you. And our great Queen wishes us to give you this portrait of her daughter, Pamina, who, alas, is now in prison. The Rastro, High Priest of the Sun, is holding her against her will in his war with our Queen. If you like this picture, and if you are very brave and clever, you may rescue Pamina. And now, Tamino, farewell, and may the gods be with you.
Conservatory of Music, as it's known, is a name given to three large organizations. Uh, the Faculty of Music of the University of Toronto being the first, the so-called School of Music of the Royal Conservatory, which is situated on Bloor Street, and the Opera School. The Opera School you've been seeing a bit of, and it is a very large part of the Royal Conservatory today. It started way back when the Conservatory was down on the corner of College Street and University Avenue, it started in a basement in one small room. It uh, didn't have the luxury of a theater or anything like that. And this went on for many years. And in that building, there was the Faculty of Music of the University of Toronto, the School of Music and the Opera School, all jam-packed together in a place that wasn't even large enough for one of them. It was, in other words, a chaos with a capital C. So the first thing we had to do was to try and separate all this amorphous mass of stuff and get each section a decent place to work and let them have the best conditions possible. So that's what we set to work to do. And we came up with the solution which we have now, which may not be ideal, but which is certainly better than the old days. And that is that we have an opera theater in the Edward Johnson building where we are now. And that theater is the headquarters of the opera school. And they also have rehearsal rooms and dressing rooms and whatnot all around it. Then up on Blue Street, only about 200 yards away, is the School of Music, which I think the building is almost bigger than this one. But it's a converted building. It isn't a new building. It's um, the old. McMaster building, I believe, where McMaster University actually started. And in it, after that, it became the School of Economics, and it is now the School of Music. Now, the Edward Johnson building's already bursting at the seams. We haven't got room, and we're having to start limiting enrollment, and it is it looks as though the building that we planned for 500 students in 1970 is already pretty well taxed to its utmost capacity. You see, not only music students work here, but a lot of students in arts courses who are taking music as a subject come in here too. The opera school is a real moloch for space. I mean, you can't give them enough. I sympathize with them. They must have a lot of space. They have a beautiful rehearsal hall under the theater, and it is the same size as the playing area of the stage. Well, we're very lucky with that wonderful theatre now for them because it has uh, pretty well everything I think that an opera director can want. I'm told that it uh, has uh, wonderful facilities. And uh, I think that we're really very lucky. Uh, what the future holds, I don't know, because uh, uh, we're always changing our outlook on the music situation at the University of Toronto. There'll probably be more reorganizations, more moving around, who is to know? But at the present moment, we are using our facilities to their utmost. And I think things are going pretty well. Chrysotomis and all the Wagnerian, not all of them, I mean, not only the lyric, Elsa Elizabeth, not the, uh, not Brunhilde, it's all this, I never sang that. And uh, in the meantime, and while I was at the Met in the summer, I went to Buenos Aires, to the Cologne, and sang there for three seasons until during the war I couldn't go there anymore. And um, then Edward Johnson asked me to come to Toronto and teach at the Royal Conservatory. And I'm ever since here. 
Well, I had uh, very uh, successful pupils like Teresa Strakas, Heather Thompson, then uh, Jeanette Zaru, Heli Sapinski, and uh, Lillian Sukis, who's also at the Met now, and many more. Father! Mother! Do you see this dagger? It has been sharpened for Zarastro. You must kill him! But dearest mother! Not a word! singer. The attainment of any worthwhile standard of proficiency requires an amount of sweat and tears and aching muscles which is staggering, almost incomprehensible to the outsider and very, very far removed from the picture of the glamour life of a stage artist that the average opera fan has. Undoubtedly, the first requirement for a budding opera singer is the right shape, size, and kind of vocal cords. The human voice is the most delicate as well as the most versatile of all musical instruments. The control of the voice is a tremendously complicated technical business. Therefore, vocal studies are the core of the student's whole curriculum. Young singers are only accepted into the opera school if they have a vocal grounding of sufficient standard. In other words, they would have studied singing for a number of years before they get anywhere near the school. When they go out into the big, wide world of the profession, the competitive world of the profession, making their debut in a tiny role of 10 lines, they would have put something like eight years of vocal training under their belt. And their vocal studies do or should go on for the whole of their professional career, yes. Callas and Tebali and all the famous singers still take singing lessons, just as Margot Fontaine goes to ballet class almost daily. So, voice technique and interpretation 
are two of the most important subjects of every opera student. At the school, each student gets two lessons, singing lessons per week with his or her teacher, and a few hours of coaching in particular roles, either by themselves or in ensemble, that is to say, together with other singers. I'm sure the normal opera fan doesn't realize that it takes anything up to several months to study a complete role with all the subtleties of inflection and so that it is memorized perfectly. The students are each given a number of scenes to learn from the widest possible choice of operas, early 17th century to the present day, according to their individual vocal ability. And as they progress through the three-year course, they get more and more roles in one of the five fully staged productions which the school mounts at its own marvelous theater in the Edward Johnson building at the University of Toronto. While the vocal training forms the essential basis of an opera singer's equipment, there are many other ingredients he has to master before he can be justly called an actor-singer. Singers are singers because they happen to have voices, not necessarily because they want to go on the stage or have any intelligence or any natural acting ability. But in our day, higher demands are made of opera than just big voices and a few pompous, empty gestures. The modern opera singer has to be a thoroughly competent actor as well. And at the school, he gets all the specialized training for such a career, which is, after all, the most comprehensive and most exciting in all the arts. All the time you sit down, you all the time crouch, rather than be able to stretch those muscles. When you stand on stage, you want this. You want to have this relaxed, long look. Not all sporty like that. No. Then, both legs. Yeah. No, one leg, I'm sorry. One leg. I won't let you balance. And just stretch it through. And bend it again. And stretch it. Oh. <laughs> quite close to her, but not too close. And um, the moment he says miraculeuse, it has some strange uh, power. You pull your hand out and look round at him a little frightened, let him explain that people who are blind used to come here and use this water, and then you turn and uh, play with the, with the fountain. Hey, it's a little bit uh, difficult to imagine this thing, but you see, what you have is a backing here, rising up like that with a sort of lion, lion's head, and it water spout uh, out in front, a little bench this side, a broken down bench, and an oval basin. You see? Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, Ali! Once again, once more, be sure your hands start, 
Stop him! Ponga, extend your arm and go down like lightning. Hurry! Ponga, once again, in my take-up, stop it! Ponga, guard, Ponga! Extend your arm, press, lunge! Aber wir lernen. Was else can man say instead of zu Abend? Ich esse Abend. Wann essen Sie zu Mittag? Ich esse zu Mittag. Um. Um at one o'clock. Um. Um. At one. Um. Um. Ein. Oder um 12 Uhr.